So our next speaker is Frederick Tunison. <clears throat> uh, I've heard him referred to as Fred, but he's definitely Frederick. And Frederick was <clears throat> perhaps, he was a postdoc of Allison's, he was perhaps the first postdoc in the Sloan Center for Theoretical Neurobiology at UCSF. <clears throat> and he's gone on uh, to stay a little closer to the nest, I think, and he's currently at UC Berkeley. Frederick, good. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right, so, so I'm going to try kind of uh, to do the impossible and is to tell you in, in 10 minutes. Um, ah, uh, let's see. Okay. So uh, as I was going to say, kind of the, the impossible task is, is to be able to tell you what the resolution is wrong. Let's see what happens if I move on and, and go and um, do this and then uh, focus on kind of the important things and kind of move on here to just uh, <laughs> Allison and maybe the resolution is, is a little bit better. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, I mean, as, as you, you know, we, we're all here because Allison touches in, in so many different ways um, as uh, both as a scientist and, and, and as a person. And, um, um, I spent three years in her lab from 1995 to 1998. They were really probably the most productive years of my scientific career and some of the best years of my life. And it's really thanks, thanks to her. And I think we're already heard by many people, um, you know, some of her unique qualities. Um, I think she was actually very demanding, right? She was, a de you know, she was demanding in terms of us as, as, as scientists and in terms of us as, as persons. So when you, when you went and talked to her, she would really question about, you know, why were you doing these experiments? Um, and, you know, this is your interpretation, but, but is this really the right interpretation? And, and really questioning you um, uh, as a scientist and, and as a person as well. I mean, what are your motivations in life? And, and are you happy? And, and so forth. It's, it's being demanding, but uh, she was demanding in a loving way. Uh, she was demanding with, with, with love, with uh, enthusiasm, with amazing amount of, of positive attitude. Um, and it's really kind of that combination that is just, just incredible, I think. Um, and um, really makes for, for productive people and happy people um, kind of the, you know, the ideal recipe for a parent, really. Kind of, you know, the loving, demanding, enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastic person. And that's, that's, how, um, that's how I remember her. So it's, it's not surprising that we work hard, but we, uh, we also had a, a great time in Sierra's a dope lab on a ski trip um, around, that, around that time. Um, my, my kind of take was going to be a little bit different. I was going to kind of give you an overview of the work that I did in her lab and how it led to, uh, to different things. And as people mentioned, uh, when uh, Allison was hired at, as UCSF, um, it was in part because of discovery of, of these incredible neurons, which are called uh, the song selective neurons that were first discovered in HVC, part of the song system. And then Allison showed that they were also found in this uh, other pathway, the anterior forebrain pathway, which is a, a, a set of brain areas that, that were known at the time to be uh, important for song learning. Um, and not only that were these neurons, these song selective neurons present, they were developing as the, as the bird was, was trying to, uh, as the bird was learning the song. Just let me show you an example of these things because they still kind of amaze me and I think people are amazing people in the field. So here's an example of, of a recording in HVC, part of the song system, of a song selective neurons when you played what uh, Steve referred to the boss, the bird's own song, and you see this very nice kind of robust response, the average of, of 50 different trials. If you play it to that neuron, the song played in reverse, poof, nothing. The response is gone. How about a song from a, a, another conspecific? Nothing. Amazing selectivity for one particular stimulus, the bird's own song. And this is not something that's, you know, maybe this is a very weird stimulus and this is also a weird song. Not the case at all. If you record from an auditory neuron, so from neuron in the auditory cortex, you see Nice responses to all these three stimulus. The system, the auditory system is very well driven. The animal pres presumably hears these sounds, but we have this kind of selectivity of the sound. So my, my first project as a postdoc was trying to look, to understand a little bit of the mechanism. What leads, you know, what, what are the features that uh, make a neuron selective, uh, selective for this? And this was a little bit of a, of a hard task because if, if it only responds to one thing, how are you gonna probe it, right? You only have one stimulus. And so the idea was like, well, well let's take that stimulus and modify it, kind of perturb around that stimulus. And so that's what we did in our, in our first paper. Um, we took a song and we just uh, decided, okay, what happens if we just keep the temporal information? So this is a spectrogram here showing time and frequency, the structure of the song, 
And here we've just kind of kept everything that has to do with time. So the temporal information is preserved, but we just got rid of the spectral information. Or we can go to another extreme where we just keep the spectral information, uh, but we kind of smear the temporal information. And we can do this at different time frequency scales to investigate what is the important uh, time, you know, time resolution, temporal resolution, and what's the important spectral resolution uh, for these neurons. And we get a tuning curve. Um, so here's a tuning curve for one of these, of, these, of these boss cells. And you can, if you focus on the top here, which, which has a frequency resolution, you can see that as you, um, you know, in some ways increase the frequency resolution by going along this dimension, that the neural response goes up. And so you need kind of a minimum of frequency resolution around 250 hertz. It needs to be able to discriminate spectral structure around 250 hertz to be able to, to get a response. One would be the, the response of the original signal that is close to that. And if you go along the, this axis in, in the other dimension, um, you can see that it also requires temporal information um, and of the scale of approximately 10 milliseconds. So these neurons are quite precise and they require both the preservation of the temporal information that is in the original song on the scale of around 10 milliseconds and of the spectral information that is in, in the song on the scale of 10 milliseconds. That's just the beginning of the story. It's still like, well, what is, you know, how do you build these neurons? What are the spectral temporal features? How are they put together? We still don't know those answers. And that was kind of like, I went from that to studying that. But I want to show you something that, um, uh, that I did in my lab in this continuation, which is, this is kind of interesting. So we were just saying that what's important in these complex sounds is these spectral temporal features. But we haven't really characterized spectral temporal features in natural sounds. So how are we going to do that? And um, the way we're going to do this is by calculating what we call the modulation power spectrum, or the MPS. And the idea is that uh, if you take a complex sound, like, like a bird song, you could represent it as a sum of these, what we call now ripple sounds, which are sounds that have just spectral structures, like this ones, or sounds that just have temporal structures, like this ones, or a mixture of sounds, or a, mixture, or a sound that has a mixture of both temporal and spectral um, uh, structure, like that one. Um, and this gives us a power spectrum that has two dimensions, two axes. On the x-axis here is a, the temporal information, and on the y-axis here is the spectral information. And you see that for zebra finch song, if you just take an ensemble of zebra finch song, that most of the information is below 50 hertz. So it's looking for changes um, that happen up to, you know, two times per, or every two milliseconds, uh, or 50 times, 50 times per second. But there's a lot of information that's even slower than that. And, and, and the other thing that you notice about this particular natural sound is that the sounds that have spectral information, that have energy along the y-axis here, are the slow ones. Okay, so we either make fast sounds that don't have very much spectral information, or slow sounds that, that, have, spectral inf that have spectral information. And speech, speech is very similar, as I will show you in a minute. So, so okay, so that's kind of a, a signature of natural sounds, these kind of you know, modulation power spectra. And, and does, does the auditor system care about this, know about this? And kind of following a little bit on, on the footsteps of some of the, the work that Bill Bialik had did with, with Fred Rickey, we uh, look at whether um, um, using, using the, the natural stimulus or using a synthetic stimulus, but that has exactly the same power spectrum uh, was driving the auditory system differently than using an artificial stimulus that, that just was, you know, didn't have any structure. That just was kind of this rectangular block here and didn't have any structure. And to make the, the story short, the answer is yes. Although there's more things to say about a stimulus like this, it has higher entropy, there was actually more information in neural responses to, to the song, to this, to this stimuli that had the kind of, this kind of uh, natural, uh, natural structure. As I mentioned, um, we went on and also uh, use this approach to look at signals that are interest to humans. The first one is, is speech. Um, and this is the molecular power spectrum of, of speech right here. And this is for male speakers and this is for female speakers. And you can notice one more thing about, about uh, the speech modulation power spectrum, especially along the spectral dimension. It has these three different little areas right here. Um, and it turns out that this corresponds to the formants uh, in speech, so the formants are this kind of spectral structure that carry information about vowels and that we use to, to understand speech. And uh, this energy right here corresponds to the, to the pitch. And then with these experiments where we were able to filter out particular modulations, spectral temporal modulations, to show that this area in red here is essential for speech comprehension. This area in blue here is essential to understand, to identify the gender of the speaker. And there's some other areas here which 
you can erase and it doesn't change anything. You can both understand the speech and, and the speaker. Uh, and this is work that I did with postdoc uh, Taffeta. Um, we also use this to look at music. And again, to make the story very short, we were interested in, in how many dimensions do you need to represent timbre. And uh, by looking at the MPS and looking at the signature here, um, along the spectral dimension mostly, we found that you need about five different dimensions to characterize timbre. I'm going through this very quickly just to give you an idea from, you know, we started with song selective neurons and we go all the way to how many dimensions do you need uh, to represent, uh, to present timbre. And this is work done by Tafta Elliott and Liberty Albinson, who is now a postdoc uh, at UCSF um, with Eddie Chang. Okay, so, so back to the, to the dope lab. So the song selective neurons, um, they're sensitive to, to spectral and temporal information. Where does that come from? So one of the things that Alison was good is, it, as people mentioned, I think Steve mentioned this, is, is to look at the mechanism, interesting the mechanism, and a lot of work in terms of um, looking at the, the circuitry, really. And, and this is a little bit of a, of a sideline, but uh, we also did some functional connectivity work. And this is work with, with Ria Kimpo to look um, at connectivity between different brain areas. And this was applied both in the song system and then in my lab to look at connectivity between the auditory system um, and, um, and the song system. Um, Ria did really kind of incredible experiments. And for those of you who are thinking about modeling the song system, and I know there's still people out there, you should go back and, and read this paper. Because she did um, simultaneous recordings from three different areas, HVC, RA, and LMAN, and got signal units in these three different areas. And the reason that this was important is that now we have really good timing uh, information about the timing throughout the circuit. So there's a direct route between HVC and RA with a propagation time of approximately uh, two to five milliseconds. It's kind of monosynaptic, very fast. And this anterior forebrain pathway that has multiple processing stages, it's much, much slower. has a delay of about 50 milliseconds. And those two kind of, you know, um, the, the, the quick direct route and this delay route, um, you know, coalesce in RA, kind of a pre-motor nucleus, um, and there's something important about, about, uh, about these two delays. Um, and I won't say any, any more than that. Um, just to say that uh, using kind of the same techniques, again, that I, that I started developing with Allison, um, looking at cross-coherence to, to look at functionality, that um, in my lab we looked at uh, the connectivity between the auditory system um, and the song system. And a graduate student in my lab is looking at, at how spatial temporal patterns of activity um, could it also code, uh, code information. All right, let's go back to 95, 98. Um, um, we're still interested in, in, in the song selective neurons. What, you know, how, how do they get that way, right? So looking at the auditory system now um, and, and trying to understand, you know, what are the features that auditory neurons respond to that we then could build up to get something like a song selective neuron. And this was a hard problem um, because, as, as I've shown on those examples, um, natural sounds, right, the auditory system seems to be responding to natural sounds. If you go to the song system, it only responds to one specific song. So we wanted to be, a, be able to get spectral temporal receptive fields, or really envision it would be spatial temporal receptive fields using natural sounds, right, using natural stimuli. And this had not been done in the field. It hadn't been done in vision, and it had not been done in addition as well. And so in her lab, we kind of developed these, these tools to be able to, to do this, to extract the spectrotemporal feature that a neuron responds to using a complex sound that has all kinds of correlations, all kinds of, of, of redundancies. It doesn't really span all possible sounds or all, all possible images. And we, I didn't know that I was doing this, uh, we kind of reinvented ridge regression here. And the reviewers didn't know it either, although it was uh, something that was invented in the 1930s. Um, but but we, we, uh, we did this, um, and, and we are able then to extract spectral temporal receptive fields using natural sounds. And, and this is just uh, to show you that it works. So uh, we used a, a kind of a, a model neuron here where we say, okay, this is the spectral temporal receptive field of this neuron. Um, we generate Poisson data um, from this model neuron. If we use the techniques that we're using at the time, which is doing a spike triggered average, which is saying, okay, what is the sound that happens before every single spike? I get a blob like this when I use song. I get a blob like this when I used um, these, these tones, so two, di two different uh, uh, sound stimuli that drive the neurons. 
And these are very far from the actual thing. But if we use our method, which as I said is a, is a, uh, you know, a home cooked ridge regression, we're able to recover the actual uh, spectrotemporal uh, receptive field. And, and just to show you that, that this was important, uh, we see that the spectrotemporal features that neurons respond to depend on the stimulus that, that you played. So if you play these random tones, so N1 and N1 is the same neuron, you actually get a neuron that doesn't like this, so it doesn't respond at all. But when you song, you get a nice receptive field. Here's a neuron that has the opposite. It seems to like the random tones and not so much the conspecific song. And this, this is very interesting. You can get this very complex spectrotemporal tuning only um, if you played the conspecific song. So this was an important tool to have to be able to, to do this test. Um, and this is work that, that we done with Kamal Sen, who was also a, a postdoc. Um, by the way, uh, this is my little moment of pride here. Um, this is the paper in, in the, all the papers that I published, non-review papers that I published that has the most citations, 264 citation. And uh, it's the same for Alison. So this is one of her three papers that has the most citations. Um, so it was also a big part of her lab it, is to develop um, tools and to study uh, the auditory system, the auditory system of birds. And most of these citations are outside of the field of bird song. Okay. So we went on and, and used these methods um, to, um, to see, okay, now that we have these tools, let's look at what type of spectral temporal receptive fields they are. And this is going to link it back to the modulation power spectrum. And what we found is that they cluster. So we can make families of spectral temporal receptive fields. And we have some that are narrow band, um, some that are wide band, some that are broad band. You could just think of these as different classes. And this is to prove that they're cluster. This is a matrix of similarities, and you can see that there's these blobs here which correspond to the different clusters, different types of, of receptive fields. And, and why does this matter? Well, it matters because um, if you look at the modulation power spectrum of sounds, um, I can make it into a cartoon. And depending on where you are here, uh, if you, you are in temporal modulations, this gives you percepts of, of, of rhythm. There's uh, uh, spectral temporal modulations that are important for percepts of timbre. There's other ones that are important for spectra of, of pitch. So this, we already have this kind of division, perceptual division to these different things. And the neurons are tiling this space in very specific ways. So there's families of neurons that are specialized for fast temporal modulations, which are going to be important for perceptions such as rhythm. And then there's families of neurons that um, are interested, that are integrated over longer periods of time. So they're slow neurons. And, and looking at a structure that's important for features, for percepts like, like pitch. Okay, and, and, and this is big in my lab. So we call this, you know, spectrotemporal receptive fields are called STRFs. So we go STRFing, um, and um, we are continuing to do this. So uh, a graduate student, Wendy Dick here, is using this to understand uh, how speech is represented in the auditory, auditory cortex uh, of humans using fMRI. Tyler Lee is, is using this to, um, to do experiments in auditory scene analysis and seeing how we can extract um, signals from, uh, from noise. And, and then Julie Eli, um, who's a postdoc in the lab, um, is looking at really kind of, is really the first person to look at the auditory system in terms of its uh, task, uh, perceptual task, which is to understand communication calls. Um, and so she's doing the from sound to meaning question um, in, in the birds. And stirfing was popular in Nelson's lab as well, and I think we'll, we'll hear about that from uh, the next, uh, next speakers, but I just want to uh, give you a, a preview. So, so Kathy uh, has done some beautiful work also looking at whether there's different types of spectral receptive fields and whether they correspond to different types of neurons, and I believe she might talk to you about, about this, and this was a, a paper in, in Neuron. Um, and then um, Gansu, um, is also, also did really nice work using electrode arrays now to look at the spatial distribution, spatial in the brain distribution of these spectral receptive fields. Um, and, and, and I really love uh, this diagram that Gunsu, is Gunsu here? No, he's not here, that Gunsu did um, uh, where, you know, you can, you can put this little spectral receptive fields inside the brain. And L2 here corresponds to layer four of a uh, mammalian cortex. So this is the input from the thalamus that gets here. And you can see that it has all these kind of narrowly tuned uh, spectrotemporal receptive fields, just like a V1 simple cells. And as you go to, you know, uh, superficial layers and deeper layers, you get kind of the more uh, complex uh, spectrotemporal uh, receptive fields. So again, there's, there's kind of analogies here. 
and, and a lot of opportunities to look at microcircuitry and, and, and uh, uh, the mechanism be behind uh, spectral temporal selectivity. And um, just to give you kind of uh, more previews uh, about the surfing continues on. So, so uh, Helen McLendon and, and, and Gun Su have used uh, techniques that were developed by Tatiana and, and Bill Bialik um, to look at um, <coughs> estimation of multiple receptive fields. So instead of describing a neuron with one of these little posture stamps, you can do it m with two or three or four. Um, and this gives you a more complete description of what, uh, of what these neurons uh, are doing. And she's talking next week on Wednesday. Uh, this is her thesis work, Helen's thesis work, about, about this. So the work goes on. Um, so that was a, um, probably too much, uh, too much information, but it was kind of what I was trying to do to give you an idea from all these, all these ideas that originated in, in, in Allison's lab. And, and um, again, just, just to finish, just, you know, just like um, Sheldon has her favorite picture, this is, this is one of, of my favorite pictures um, of, of Allison. And, and I, you know, um, I can't thank her enough for um, what, she, what she did for me. And, um, um, you know, I think the, the, the way kind of, this is maybe, I don't know, too positive, but the, the, you know, she touches all personally and that's irreplaceable. Um, you know, she was unique and she meant something that's unique for us and that's not something that we can bring back um, and it's just something that we keep in our memories. Um, um, but the, the thing that she did for, for science and train us as a scientist is something that, that goes on and that we can, um, um, you know, copy, model and, and, and do with our, um, with our students and, uh, and with the people that we love and we care. So, thank you.